Simple cube used for storing office supplies. Or is it? In his book, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion, Brian Melvin describes miles and miles of cubes, each one containing a person suffering the same punishment they inflicted on others before they died. Next, on Stories of the Supernatural. In 1980, I was a rough and ready kind of a guy. I... Drank a lot and partied a lot, and I was moved to Tucson, Arizona, and I was working at a construction site. And uh, one of the guys brought some water from Mexico that was contaminated. And I ended up drinking it by accident. Got real sick, contracted cholera, and within about 72 hours, I was flat on my back and basically dehydrated. That's when I passed away. I noticed that when I passed on that, of course, I wear glasses and I'm very nearsighted. I noticed that, the first thing I noticed is that I wasn't wearing my glasses and I could see clearly across the room. And when I turned my head, I noticed that my body wasn't moving. And I was lifted right out of my body and hovered over my body looking down at myself and looking around. And next thing I knew, I went through the ceiling of the, of the room I was in and I was in as transported into a very, very, very black, dark void. I could hear like somebody speaking to me, like, like telepathy. And it was explaining to me many, many things that I have, I no longer remember, but most of the, the idea was, was explaining to you the whys of life. Um, why there was evil in the world, why, why this, why, you know, people have questions all the time. These were being answered to you as you were being transported to this light. And time you got to, the, to where the light was, you were, you knew, you knew what happened, you know what's going on, you know, you know what happened, you know you died, you know you're going to be judged, and everything that's, as you're traveling, it's made so clear to you that what's happening is perfectly just and right. Oh yeah, I was going through the, the darkness and I was approaching the light there. And I noticed that on this rock, it was a big huge boulder right out in the middle of this darkness. And there was a person sitting on a throne. And the individual that was sitting on it um, was emanating light, very, very powerful, bright light. And there was a love and compassion too, but also a firmness and fairness emanating from this person and I'm going, you know, who is this? And the basic question that was coming to me through this thought was, look what you have done with God's gift. That was actually Jesus was speaking this to me. He said, if I let you into heaven with what you know now, that I'm just right, perfect, you would misuse that and keep sin alive in heaven. You can't come in. He told me it was granted to me to see a land unknown that's best forgotten, but will not be left unseen. That was it. And then he took out all these keys out of his robe, just pulled them out. And as he pulled them out, you could see the, the scar where the, the, the nails were kind of like in the wrist area and it kind of pulled the bones apart. It's kind of traumatic looking. And he had these keys and the keys were odd shapes and design. And he opened up a, he walked over to a place and he opened, stuck this key into this, looked like a, a gate. And a door opened. Then the veil came over and it was dark again. I couldn't see it. All I could see was the Lord. And I was being moved toward this door and I went through the, that door into a void. I mean, a, a tornado vortex. It was just going round and round. It was a tunnel spinning horrendously around. Just, roaring and roaring and spinning and spinning and spinning. And it smelled horrible. I could hear these screeches and noises and sirens. The most thing that I remember the most was slurping noises and, and um, screams and I could, you could feel um, heat, really hot heat. The next thing you know, I was falling through the sky. 
you know, it looked like the sky, and I hit the ground. You know, it kind of hurt, and I stood up, and I, and I looked, and I go, where am I? All these people ran out. And some of them looked like people that were dead that I knew, and other people I knew that were not dead. And they come around me, slapping me on the back. And I said, they got there awful quick because the house looked far away, but they, all of a sudden they were there, slapping me on the back, woken me there. But something just wasn't quite right with them because they looked weird. They had yellow glints in their eye, and their eyes were almost uh, reptile-like. I looked over and I saw what looked like my best friend turn into somebody else and I, and I said hey wait a minute you can't do that this is this you're not who you say you are who are you and then all of a sudden I looked around and I go all these things that all these people around me are not people I begin to morph into what they were they were ugliest creatures I've ever seen <laughs> yeah, Kyle like some of them oh they were just god awful like rotting vegetables and they were distorted and twisted, and then they were not perfect by no means. And they were just filthy, smelly creatures. And they were just starting to come at me like they're going to shred me to pieces. And they started, one tried to grab me right across my chest, and one tried to grab my legs. And while they're trying to tear you to pieces, they backed away, and this one that looked like my best friend earlier, who morphed into different people, came up to me. It was a Little, it was about four eight. Looked like a sort of half dinosaur, a reptilian type creature, and it was hissing and spitting at me, and, and uh, was speaking in language that I couldn't, I didn't know what it was saying at first. I was telling, and it was broken in English. It was telling me to come, follow it, follow it, follow it. So he motioned to me and we took a few steps and all of a sudden we were at the end of the horizon. That doesn't make any sense, but we came across to what looked like the end of the horizon. You couldn't go any further and I couldn't understand what it was. And yet I could look out and I could see all this vast fields and mountains. And, and then he stuck, that creature stuck its hand in this horizon and he ripped it open like a veil and he stepped out of it up on to this road and he telling me to come motioning me to come so I did the same I just went ahead and I got out and next thing I knew I was on a large wide dusty flat road I just came out of a cell a cube it was either it was around 10 by 10 foot square it could have been 14 by 14 that's what the dimensions were and and there was a cell next to it next to it and there was a cells above it kind of set back concave so they're going up and there were six of them to the roof of the uh, of of this place, and in the walls are embedded peoples in cells. And he pointed to another cube, and in this cube, I was looking at there were people inside these cubes. Some were vacant. Some people were waiting for people to arrive, like I did. There was this person in there, and. I was just looking at them, and then it was showing me another person, another person. Each person that was in their cube was like they were reliving parts of their life all over again, but they, and not in a very pleasant way, it's like a living nightmare. When we return, Brian Melvin is taken deeper into hell, where he sees people in torment, among them one of the most notorious murderers in history. Next, on Stories of the Supernatural. Brian Melvin died after being infected with cholera from drinking water. He describes how his soul was separated from his body and taken to hell. While in hell, his demon guide showed him miles of cubes, most of them containing the souls of people suffering their own personal hell for their deeds during their life on earth. And as we were walking along, um, I realized that hell is just an enormous big place and there's many other parts to hell that I did not see. I just saw this place called the pit. And so it says, it's been granted to thee, follow me out to the middle of the road. So we walked out in the middle of the road and all these demons and creatures running around and I you know, saw all these people in various stages of torment. And some of these demon creatures inside these cubes were going in at will. 
and they would be attacking people in various ways. But to the people, they look like other people or times in their lives, or they look like demons. Whatever their worst nightmare was is basically what they were living. We walked along to another cube, looked inside of another individual that was there, and it reminded me of a, an old sailing ship. And um, this guy used to be a captain of the ship, and he was being flogged. Things that he did on this old sailing ship, but he did uh, he did it for pleasure for these people because it was his ship, and he liked to be mean to his, his crew, and it was being met it back to him. I noticed this, this being, this creature looking at me, it was in, in a cube at first, and the person who was looking at this particular, into this creature, is one of those tall creatures with the round, with the faces that went, went around, but it was of a beautiful purplish color, in a way, kind of a beautiful creature, but hideous at the same time. And with its faces revolving around, very seductive, very, very flattering, very, very persuasive. It would try to plant thoughts in your mind, trying to tell you, why would such a good God allow people to suffer like this? It was trying to get me to curse God. I really don't know who the demon creature was. I know he had great power and authority. He either was a second in command or he could have been Satan himself. His one vortex was spinning and a lady that had just died in a car wreck came through and she de was deposited right there. And I saw her as she arrived, and inside her cube, she saw it as the illusion of her grandmother's farm, that her grandparents' farm that she loved so well as when she was growing up. And her grandmother recently passed away too, so she got in this, this cube, and immediately she thought she was in heaven because there was a grandmother waiting there welcoming me. The grandmother that was actually a demon that gave the illusion of being the grandmother said, Dear Pudding, she made it to heaven. I'm so glad you're here. And she really thought that she was in paradise. But there was a darker side to her. She would make her children be what she wanted. Her children wanted something else. She wanted them to be this. And if they didn't do it her way, it was the fist. It was verbal abuse. It was cutting down. So, as she sat down, I was watching it, and the tree's limbs just grabbed her. And then she realized she was not in paradise. And as we passed some cubes, there were people inside, and they were trapped in flames. And it was like their skin was still intact, but they were burning. And there was an individual, and he was playing pool. And this guy was a child serial killer, but he lived in the 1940s. And he, but he was in this pool hall playing this pool before the punishments would commence again. He thought he had a break. And then these people in there would torment him and come and run and just grab him and tear him up. And out of the sky, I could see this um, big, big demon coming down. It reminds me of a snake. He just gobbled him and swallowed him. Then all these other little demons came up and said, you know, that's no fair. We didn't have our chance with him yet regurgitated him back up, he was whole. I know this sounds really bizarre, but that's what happened. Then all the other little demons, little teeny things, about a foot, three foot tall, just jumped on him, and he was powerless. And they were beating him and clawing him, and there was no rest for this guy whatsoever after that. It was constant torment. Everything that he ever done was, was being justly put back to him. Came to a cube, and I was looking at this, and this was a woman. She was dressed in fine garb, she was a temple prostitute, basically what it was, and she was somebody who died in Corneth around 69 AD. For a price, she would have a, a, a newborn son. For some reason, their religion was some strange thing. When you have a newborn son, you can offer it to, into a statue, and there's flames under the statue. You put the baby on the statue, and the, basically the baby would be cooked. And here she is in this temple, there was no let up to her torment. It was almost like all the little babies that she burned that were hers and other people's were tormenting her, mocking her, pouncing on her, just crawling and tearing her up. And she just screamed and I had to turn away and walk. There was a, an individual that um, she practiced the black dark craft. She was a witch. I just knew that she was a witch, but she died many, many, many hundreds of years ago. But 
She was trapped in a coffin, scratching, trying to get out. She couldn't get out. She was in, in that position for years and years and years and years, hundreds of years. And then finally, when she got it open, all the demons would pounce on her. And I walked on to another cube. We looked in this other cube on, the, on this row, and there was another lady. And she believed that Mother Earth could save her. And then if she honored the trees and the rocks, and she was into this nature thing, and part of their religious practice that she would practice would be getting out in the fields and dancing around a fire with a bunch of other people doing the same. The people that she thought that she was with were actually demons, and they would come up to her and say, you did this, they pick up a stone. You say, the stone will save you here, and they smacked her with it. So she was standing there, and the demons reached down there and, and reached in her mouth, ripped out her tongue and part of her thing. Says, you talk bad? Oh, the stones are not going to save you. Nobody can save you. Then they ripped off her, just actually took her skin and just peeled it off. It was really slow and agonizing to shreds until nothing to the skeletons. Then they took the bones and broke the bones. And she felt everything. Then her body would come back together. The flesh would come back together, and she'd be whole again, and it would start all over again. A different scene would happen. And some of the cruelest people on earth were in these. Um, you know, some people, I don't like to say names of people or anything like that, but I will, will you know, this one particular individual is definitely there, and everybody knows who, who, who it is. It's Adolf Hitler. Hitler was sitting in a cube. The cube was open and it was just burning flames. He's just sitting there burning. And his flesh wasn't burning, and he had this hideous look on his face. And he was, as he was burning, the flesh would be rotting, and he was feeling every bit of it. It was almost like every oven of the gas, uh, of the concentration camps, all the tortures that went on there were being meted back to him in one intense flaming bit of stoked up a white hot heat that would rot his flesh away at the same time, make him ashes, come back. He was just being tormented like that. He was just, I remember having this weird look on his eyes. It was just angry, vicious anger. When we return, Brian Melvin tells how for a moment he thought he may be trapped in hell for all eternity. We were walking in another segment of, of hell near the back recesses of the wall, another segment of the deep dark pit. And we're coming to this one pit that was, there was one place, and this, the cube was open, and inside there, this demon was trying to get me to go inside this cube in what looked like a dentist chair. I'm not afraid of dentist at all, but this thing looked like a dentist chair to me with all these hideous creatures in there trying to say, this is where you are going. And they want you in this cube here. And they were trying to get me in there. And I didn't want to go. And this part is very hard for me. Because you got to understand, you are so scared. And only this whole time you're there, you're just saying, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. By that time, I was probably saying Jesus Christ so fast, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ so fast that it was a blur. That's all I can say. They wanted me in this cube and I was scared. I didn't want to go in this thing. And like I said throughout the whole time, you felt a connection with somebody from above, the Lord. And then all of a sudden you could feel something coming for you. I, I was so petrified I couldn't distinguish what it was. You could feel the footsteps walking behind you and the ground thundering. And as it closer, whatever it was, was walking behind me. And I was too scared to turn away to see who it was because I didn't want these things to rush me and grab me. And all of a sudden, they started coming toward me. And then the presence got right behind me, and they all scattered. And that purplish, big, tall, demonic creature, the regal creature, kind of backed slightly away and kind of bowed and kind of walked out, just kind of slithered on into the, into the mist, into the darkness of hell. And the Lord was carrying me up. And I knew who it was, it was Jesus. He picked me up. 
this part I remember though so so clearly. He just picked me up in his arms and I could see the and they crucified him. As he's holding me his his bones are pulled apart. He's saying I <laughs> he pulled apart my bones. And he carried me. And kinda floated through the air and went through the the center of the bottomless pit. I went straight up. I remember bits and pieces of being taken to a hospital and waking up in a hospital room and nurses poking me. And when I woke up out of this thing trying to breathe, I grabbed the doctor and said, I'm not in a cube, am I? <laughs> I better not be in a cube. And the doctor says, no, you're in a hospital. <laughs> and for me, I was no longer an atheist. <laughs> There was a God, there is a heaven, and there is a hell.